Um, what I also found interesting is that BBC article, when it speaks about the violence that um, Picton inflicted on black people, on slaves, enslaved people in Trinidad, it explains it away by saying Picton felt vulnerable and he therefore used brutality to control the um, black population. Now this idea of a white man be feeling vulnerable is very often used still today. We come across this phrase, a phrase in um, articles and in courtrooms and it's often a defense for a white man who's done something quite brutal or aggressive but he felt vulnerable. So Picton's um, conviction went from Trinidad all the way back to the UK. It got quite a lot of attention at the time and Picton was convicted of having um, permitted the use of torture against this child, against Luisa Calderon, but later his conviction was overturned. Um, he died the battle in Wellington. So his name was very quickly redeemed and he became this military hero that had several paintings and several statues attributed to him. There's a statue in City Hall. There's also a statue in Camarden. Um, and here we have a few quotes uh, from a local historian in Camarden who argues that these statues serve a purpose. So his argument is that they provide a talking point and that if you forget the names, you forget history, and that would be a terrible shame. Luisa Calderon was given into a household by her mother at the age of 11, and in this household she was the mistress of a businessman. And I just wanted, again, to, for all of us to remember that she was a child um, at the age of 11, a mistress. So at the age of 14, another man came through that household and had some relationship or another with Luisa. The second man also seems to have stolen some money from that household. And it was this theft as well as possibly some sexual jealousy of the other guy in the house that then placed Luisa in this position where she was tortured in order to find out where this money had gone to but possibly also to extract revenge. She was suspended from the ceiling. Um, one of her arms and one of her legs were tied together behind her back and her foot was rested on a blunt wooden spike so that she was precariously balancing with all of her weight pressing down. And this would have been very, very painful. That was continued for several hours then continued again the next day. And after this torture, she was kept in a dungeon, she was chained to the wall, and the place she was kept in was so low that she couldn't stand up or stretch. She was kept in that place for eight months. This torture caused a bit of a stir, a bit of an outrage. This trial made it all the way to the UK where he was um, initially convicted, but then later on acquitted. She gave um, evidence in court and then eventually she returned to Trinidad. She died some years later, still um, a poor woman, but we do not know much about her history, forgot her. So I was hoping that maybe Abu Bakr could come in at this point and tell us a little bit more about um, the structure of society in Trinidad at that time what it meant to be a mulatto and what social structure she might have lived in. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Right, just to describe what a mulatto is. A mulatto basically is a male or the female that is what we would now refer to as mixed race, okay? So it's usually a white father and an African mother. It was rare, it was very rare that black women consented to many of the sexual advances that took place on the plantations. Other things I want to mention as well, there was two types of um, what you would call the colored people, okay? They were known as colored people because a slave society was stratified with four different types of groups. So the first groups you had were the mechanics. The mechanics were a group of people that were the, the technical engineers, okay? They were the technical engineers. So they, they constituted the majority within Caribbean society. So they would have been the builders, the carpenters, 
you know, the engineers, the people who built the cards, the people who did the shoes, you know, shoelaces, boots, yeah, clothes. They were referred to as the mechanics. One of the unfortunate things that we find that we watch any movie on slavery, okay, it's literally being whitewashed. They usually focus on the plantation slaves, okay, but they were the minority. They're not the majority, they were the minority. Then you had another group of people which were known as domestic servants. Domestic servants could be male as well as female, okay. Then you had what was known as the headman. Their job, basically, they were known as the headman. So sometimes they were the head of plantations. They were the head of the mechanics. Sometimes they were the head of the households. Okay, It was a very privileged position and a compromising position as well. And then the last group of people which you had, which you were your plantation hands. They were known as field hands. So that was a slaveocracy society. Then you had what was known as the hierarchical structural society amongst whites. In the Caribbean, there were four groups, there were four ethnic groups of whites. The first one were your English. They were the ones who were the top of the uh, hierarchical structure. Then your Scottish, then your Welsh, and then your Irish. There was a lot of war between England and Ireland. A lot of the prison of wars that came out of Ireland were sent to the Caribbean. A lot of Irish will be will becoming indentured servants on the plantations, along with the slaves. So you have your planters, you have your merchants, men of profession, and then you have your subordinate whites. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, Thank you for providing a bit of context. Um, you can imagine it was a society that was structured around race, that was structured around class, that was structured around power with um, very many people at the bottom and very few people at the top and Picton right at the top of everything during his time as governor in Trinidad. I was just wondering, Doug, if you could jump in quickly and kind of tell us more about how Picton was seen and received in Wales how he ended up in the city hall, basically. Why are we celebrating this man? Or why was he celebrated? Right, well, I'll just give maybe a little bit more back on Picton. He was uh, a pretty despicable character, to be honest. Um, he wasn't only the governor of uh, Trinidad. He was also a, a plantation owner and a slaveholder. Um, and I think the other thing just to note is when he was taken to trial with over the Louis Sir Calderon, uh, charges. This was just that was one of a number of charges that were against him. When he goes to trial, obviously he gets convicted in the first trial, um, but then he appeals, and his his appeal is paid for basically partly by him, but also by the slaveholders back in the plantation owners back in Trinidad. Picton. I mean, uh, uh, William Darrow, his prosecutor at the trial, said that he had disgraced the country to which he was born and stained the British character. Um, and it looks like he very um, quickly everything was forgiven and forgot. Yeah. Uh, he redeemed himself. But yeah, by 1807, he's, he's taken to see the king. Uh, so he, obviously he's, he's, he's quite forgiven then. And then Wellington picked him to fight in the Peninsula War. Um, obviously he was the highest ranking officer to die at Waterloo. And uh, he's then regarded as a, as, a, as a great hero, a great military hero. After his death, you see a lot of Welsh poems and eulogies to his name, to, to him. Um, and then even in the 1819 step, which is what, four years after his death in Carmarthen, Thomas Picton is the, you know, the, 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 the big subject there. Picton has had a massive influence in Welsh history. Um, so far, you can argue, I don't know how much, but he is part of Welsh history in certain level. And by taking that picture or the statue away you are removing a certain element of that history i have a huge dilemma to do with what, to do with what to do with the pictures and the statues i do part of me feels like it has to be um some element of it has to be remembered stored in some ways um but also i feel that um history is always written by the winners as such and by that, basically, you don't have an, a, a very balanced narrative. That balanced narrative doesn't happen a lot in these statues or pictures. 
I think when it comes to when it comes to statues and images and things like that, there is dualness here. There is a dual thing which needs to be understood. You know what? The way you, the way you see in German, the way you see people going to Auschwitz to see this is what's happened. This was wrong. We 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 have never had that. So all we want is an acknowledgement to say, look. This is what happened, you know. We acknowledge that this was wrong. That is why it's important to have it in the history books to say, look, the same way we look at Hitler, you look at us. The same way you look at the Germans to say they had Hitler, we look at, we look at Churchill and what he did. That history is never told. All we want is an acknowledgement to say, look, what we, the same, we understand the same way you look at Hitler, you look at us. So that's my point. When yeah. it comes to history, I was taught. Yeah. I was taught about him as a military hero, Welsh figure. Of course, I went away and researched him. I was like, oh, about five years ago, I um, there was a there was a petition then to get rid of the statue, and I got yeah. involved with that. But um, in general, I don't think he's taught about. Right. He is. He's taught about as a hero, which is. Yeah, yeah. I want, I want to I want to come in quickly. A couple of people have mentioned this history is always written by by victors. There 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 is a there is a saying actually uh, from from uh, I think somewhere in the west of Africa that says that until a, a lion learns how to write, the story will always glorify the hunter. Today we are the lions. Okay, we're not waiting for tomorrow. Today we are the ones who are to decide. We are the ones who are to host the debate, and we should not be apologetics on behalf of people who failed to properly assess this man's status a hundred years ago. If we're going to preserve some memory of them, okay, let it be done in a way that really de-glorifies everything that's been glorified about these guys without properly assessing their whole stature. That's, that is my point. I think what Britain needs is a museum of colonial history. That's what it needs. It needs these statues to go into a building where we can teach the atrocities done and that closure can be made on a lot of this stuff or education can be applied. I think where Picton statue is taken down from, a statue of the girl should be built or made and put there instead. So... I, th I think in some ways museums have been some of the slowest really to think deeply about the changes that need to be made. Much greater emphasis on, on a museum being a platform for different voices as opposed to the voice of authority from who knows where. I would hope that we're on a process of change as an organisation um, and we need um, discussion, advice, guidance and challenge as part of that process of change.